<laughs> Good morning. Do you ever feel like that sometimes? <laughs> Trying to take off with the heavy payload, underfunded mission, <laughs> bouncing, trying to get aloft, barely clearing the wires, not quite sure if or where you're gonna land. That's what, that's what it's felt like to me. <laughs> Working in the nonprofit world. Before grandfather flew across the Atlantic, people who flew in airplanes were called barnstormers and daredevils and flying fools. And after he made that flight, People who flew in airplanes were called pilots and passengers, and that really shifted the world's perspective about what aviation could be um, used for. The man on the right, his name is Raymond Ortig, and he owned a hotel in New York, and he owned a hotel in Paris. In 1919, he put up a $25,000 prize to be awarded to the first team who could fly nonstop between the cities of New York and Paris in either direction. Very simple prize. And a funny thing happened. That seven teams spent $400,000 trying to win a $20,000, $25,000 prize. So Ortig leveraged his money by a factor of 16. And all of that research and development went into long distance air travel. That's incredible leverage. People forget that aviation was developed primarily by two things, by warfare, and by prizes. So how do we leverage that idea into the future and create the future of flight? A prize. Here's how I'm going to get to space. He was an astronaut wannabe, and he, he was frustrated that he probably wasn't going to get to fly into space. Um, and he thought, if we offer up a big enough prize, we can sort of jumpstart this industry and create the launch vehicles where I can pay money and go fly into space. Peter's a great storyteller, and he got to these CEOs of Fortune 500 companies time and time again, and they loved it. OK, let's do this. So what's wrong? Well, when they go to the lawyer of the company, and the lawyer says, you want our logo on an untested experimental rocket ship? <laughs> what if that thing explodes? We bought a hole-in-one insurance policy that guaranteed $10 million would be paid to the winners if they did those flights before January 1 of 2005. So the clock was ticking. We should have failed, but we succeeded spectacularly. And did I mention our backup plan for the $10 million prize? If you could do those flights, but couldn't do them until after January 1, we had a really cool trophy for you. <laughs> that was our backup plan. We'd been at it for so long. It took, it took eight, nine years to really deliver that. And it was incredibly empowering to be a part of a small team of people who, who made that happen, who shifted the world's perspective on space flight. Got Spaceship One hanging in the Air and Space Museum next to my grandfather's plane. We changed the world. That's empowering. So how do we do that again? Not being a, really a rocket scientist, I set my sights back on aviation. What are the problems facing aviation and how do we solve those? How do we make aviation clean and quiet and make it exciting for kids? My family has been advocating for conservation of endangered species for 50 years. Now, we have a solution. The time is now. Thank you. I don't know why that makes me emotional. Maybe this is because you're the first people who have seen this. And it is powerful. But we have the technology today to solve the problems that we created yesterday. So what, uh, before I start crying, um, <laughs> let me move on. And say, what happens when you give a guy like me another chance at life? That, that memory of me disabled is, is fading. 
I can exercise, I can work, I can travel. Indeed, I can change the world. And that's my story. I'm always trying to escape from gravity, the gravity of life, trying to fly, fly into space. And sometimes it's just getting up out of bed in the morning. This morning, <laughs> yeah, I won't tell you about this morning. But, but it's hard, it's intense. But I gotta keep doing it. And, and it makes me feel incredibly humble to be speaking to you guys. Because, you know, if you read the news, if you watch politics, it's tough. It's an interesting time that we're in right now. But you guys are out there saving the world, one elephant at a time, one hospice at a time, um, et cetera, et cetera. This room, more than any politician, has the power to create the change that we need in the planet. That's humbling. And that gives me hope the greatest gift of all.